Good afternoon and welcome to the Creative Writing Department's first showcase of the year. My name is Shell Swaby and I am a senior creative writer. I hope that you all will enjoy our selection of poetry and, po and prose pieces. Please note that there will be some pieces that contain graphic content and imagery. Now, I invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Hello, my name is Gabriella Alvarison, and I will be reading to you my piece called Farewell, Our Universe. May a hundred years pass, but your name is forever ingrained in my mind. The world may end, but the stars still shine bright. Did you know? The stars have feelings too. They sing on their live festive nights. Sometimes I think the stars we see may have burned out and we are looking at echoes of the past. Like when I search your name in the stars, unable to properly grieve. The stars may never hold your name, but I won't forget you. Nothing else in this world matters to me except your smile. If I could grasp the stars for you, I would bring you the moon instead. I want to be held in your loving embrace as you murmur your adoration for me. May you and I pass knowing we were loved. Good night, moon. May your rest be peaceful. I'll be yours until the stars fall and you won't be there to pick me up. Thank you. Hello, my name is Valor Nunziato, and I'm going to be reading my poem titled, Let a Memory Remind You, Don't Get Comfortable. Don't get comfortable. This poem isn't going to be airy. This poem isn't going to be fun. This poem is for all who have been called a fairy or for the kids who sweat at night, worrying that their faces are someday going to meet a gun, an aggressive opening you may believe. But these lines are actual realities that people still, to this day, conceive. So I shall cease with my messy rhymes to serve you a bold statement about these times. Born a simple son, a brother, and a friend of mine, brainy rather than brawny, and faithful rather than formidable, to God he was devoted to. But nothing divine, nothing of this plane or the next could have prepared him for the targeted violence of this world and lifetime unjust and unfair. They snatched him up in a simpleton's truck, drove him into the night and out into a field where they tortured and bashed him relentlessly. He shed so many tears as the blunt pistol struck, face to face with a gun that did not shoot because two men wanted their twisted fun. He died nonetheless for his soul and for the grieving family, God bless, his motionless body they tied to a barbed wire fence. People passed him by, thinking he was a scarecrow, but the only thing his two assailants were scared of was the fact that their victim was a gay man. When the police found the victim, his face was red, not with righteous anger, but with blood, the only clear skin that they could see derived from tears that had the chance to flee. A fractured skull and a bludgeoned head, when the police got the perpetrators, they had found that the two men had stolen all of what little their victim had. Do these details even get you upset? Do they even get you mad? His life snuffed out at 21, but the raging fire that had filled empathetic hearts had only just begun. His name was Matthew Shepard. The, the culprits had the audacity to claim that Matthew Shepard's homosexuality was the thing to blame. The gay trans panic defense was weaponized by people like those two men to try and get the jury to acquit to be completely queer and clear less than a decade ago, and this is true, any one of our Lavender brothers, sisters, and siblings could have been murdered just for the defendant to stand and plead as if they didn't make our friends and family bleed. Your Honor, when I found out they were a fag, I was so terrified to the point that I just had to send them home in a body bag. So born in a body I wished was clay, just so that I could have molded it to my ideal, Growing up was something I wanted to delay. An artist, an outcast, and a dreamer I was, stuck in my own head. Opening up led to so much dread. After school, during a cloudy spring day, four distant peers of mine approached, and from my bus home, they took me. 
down to a park that was only five minutes away. I thought it'd be fun if I pretended it was normal, the fact that these boys asked me of anyone to play. Baseball felt fine for an innocent time, but a possible wolf in sheep's clothing is something you should never doubt. As I threw myself across the ground to catch the ball, I could remember the dirt that filled my respiratory system as I inhaled that short-lived ephemeral joy. As if in harmony, they cackled loudly. loudly. A few of them crashed and piled onto me. I was happily howling too as the first punch struck and my gut is where I felt it, my face the next, then repeated stomping on my legs. Laughing soon, mutated into agonized begging. I no longer had sight of the gray skies above me, just silhouettes of the boys who were playing a game where I was always going to be the loser. Kill yourself, faggot. You're already killing me. You're already killing me. I stopped reacting after the ninth crunchy punch to my nose that felt like a broken dam. A natural crimson flooded into my mouth and down my jaw. A metallic, warm taste, a wet feeling. I'm glad they never swung at me with one of the bats. I stopped pleading after the pain in my legs molded into an acute numbness. They left me to sob uncontrollably as the sun too uncontrollably set. I limped home in the saddening sprinkles that ensued with a bloodied nose and bruised body. Strangers stared me down lower than I had already felt, so low, in fact, that I had wished I had just stayed. Stayed there, stayed there laying, defeated and dying, my pride no longer thriving, but I got back up and dragged myself home instead. I never publicly told a sorrowful soul my story until about a year ago. I never expected nobody to believe me, the gay boy versus the four other heterosexual and cisgender boys. I lived at least, I lived past it, I survived. Believe me now as I am proud, proud to tell you all this, proud to write, proud to be here and be alive. My name is Valor Annunziato. I relayed this prophetic poem to alert everyone and anyone who pretends to care that our battle for acceptance is never over. Never get comfortable, don't get comfortable. I don't care about silly Twitter troubles or goofy guffaws at online obstacles and distractions, tearless as you scroll past the news article atrocities, but don't be fearless that, to the fact that your name in one of them headlines can be one of the possibilities. So look up, I tell you, look up. Look me in the eyes and tell me you've looked at them, them, those who you can see face to face and through news reports of murders and hate crimes. We really put a homo in homicides now, don't we? Don't allow yourself to waste the memories of the many Matthew Shepherds or the pulses of our brothers, sisters, and siblings that slipped through the violent hands belonging to the plenty, still oppressing us, still fighting us, still beating us, still killing us. Club Q is queer, a label that they'll never actually fear, something we know from the times they shot us up to Swiss cheese under an American flag as they damaged many of our own that were wavering in surrender in places like Orlando, Florida 2016, or recently Colorado Springs 2022. Footage of their bodies dropping like flies all on screen. Let them be remembered, let them be seen. I tell you all this now to reiterate, don't get comfortable. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ava Berthelow Hill, and I'll be reading my poem, 13 Ways of Looking at Anxiety. One, something you can't hear, something you can't see. All it is, it's a feeling. Two, a feeling that shuts you down. It locks the door of the home you wish you had. Three, wishes aren't cheap, and in your mind, you weep. It's all in your head the judgment you're afraid of. Four, they judge you as you walk by, or so you think. Anxiety is a cruel person who beats you up inside. Five, inside you feel like throwing up. All the fears and worries are breaking you down. Six, finally, you collapse. Seven, you lose your mind. Anxiety makes you go insane. Eight, you fear everything. You think you're stupid. Nine, all you think about is how people hate you. 10, you hate yourself for the panic attacks and late nights you stay up because you think everyone hates you. 11, you become anxiety. 
You cry for hours through long nights. 12. Anxiety becomes you. Anxiety becomes a personality. You can't get rid of it. 13. You can't get rid of it. It's a part of you now. Thank you. Hello, my name is Cassandra Claremont, and I will be reading my poem entitled, Death in War. Their eyes are looking at me, staring at me, piercing through to my bare soul. I see the betrayal stuck on their faces. They were waiting for promised help, but I can't help them, not from here. I sit in a safe chair in my living room, viewing the poor unlucky souls who were in the wrong place. The protective glass of the TV screen shields me from the lightning storm inside that strikes random areas and targets random groups of people. Now their severed limbs lie on the floor next to the paralyzed dying bodies that were hit by the unnecessary lightning along with everyone else nearby. They rest in black and white as they wait for the storm to subside, hoping for the slim chance to see the warm sunlight one last time. Thank you. Hi everyone, um, my name is Zayla. I have two pieces for you today. The first one is titled Breathless Words, and the second one is called For Mama. Sometimes I wish that my heart wasn't empty full. Sometimes I wish I could tell you what that meant. Full with emptiness, yet empty because I'm not truly full, if that even makes sense. Words are breathless, yet carry so much meaning. I wish I could just be a word, a simple, breathless word, just as your name, breathtakingly breathless breathless. Something at the tip of your tongue that rolls off perfectly. Something that your taste buds find amusement in. A word so airy yet holds so much weight like air in your lungs. A breathless word needed to form a proper sentence. A word that catches your eyes when they start to wander off. Drift apart from the rest of me, the real me. Slip into maladaptive daydreaming of the word I am. To try to recreate the words used in this just to fail, for you don't know what I mean not understanding the impact breathless words have. Breathless because they take your breath away. Breathless because I hold my breath trying to come up with the right things to say without them coming off as a gust of dewy Connecticut wind. Sometimes I wish I could express my emotions without writing. Sometimes I wish you could understand the breathless words I'm using right now. Sometimes I wish I was with you, saturating you with my breath and my words. Sometimes my full empty heart gets in the way of that. Sometimes, I wish that I didn't wait until my feet hit the stage to tell you that I wanted you, needed you, just like the words I'm using, breathlessly. Young girl, oh. young, girl young heart, young mind, adulting its way into becoming a mother. My mother carved my exoskeleton so that I could form my body in it. The loss of blood, sweat, and tears were reincarnated into I, so that these were used for good. Years ago, my mother first told me that she looked up to me, that all the things I have taken on as an occupation was breathtaking. Little ignorant me, hearing that my parent looked up to me and adored me, how mentally stronger than her I was to hold myself to a higher standard than most. Hearing those words fall off the tip of her tongue crushed my soul. How inquisitive a child could look in the eyes of her maker. I hated it. Mother and I have never truly had a great relationship ever since I started to grow up, started to realize how much we have little in common. Once I started to grow as myself, the things I had to endure, hear, and see, we drifted apart. Despite that, my true feelings toward her never changed. How much stronger physically she was than I, never letting sticks or stones break her bones, for she turned into a brick wall, cool and grounded, 
shape-shifting her pain and trauma into a business, investing the broken pieces of her body into mine, disregarding the I hate yous or the get out of my faces. Never did she stop investing. Being a woman in this world is painfully draining, heartbreaking, or even gut-wrenching. Raising a child is even worse. Constantly worried of my next move, would I make a stupid one? Would I end up just like her? Or would I overcome the line of spikes laid out on the pavement for me and become something great? My mother gave her life for mine, throwing her unshielded body into a pit of fire so that mine could blossom and bloom into a phoenix. She was a weed who gave birth to a wildflower, dislocating her virgin knuckles to beat down anyone who dared touch her creation. Favorite song is Girl on Fire, though no one cared out to no one cared to put out hers crisping her maple skin so that my midnight sky of a skin could glow and grow as wide as a galaxy. Never once did I thank her for the suffering she endured, not once did I vocalize how much I wanted to become her. How the weapon of her body beats the pillow of feathers of mine, how society told her that her hands were made to hold a man's, so she turned them into daggers. How her words trickle off her sword of a tongue in such a profound country way, how that overrules the honey in mine. But if I had to choose what kind of worker I would be, what kind of woman I would be, what kind of enforcer I would be, it would always be her. If I had the chance to, I would give up anything for her. Over and over again, multiplied by pi, it would always be her. To my God, my creator, my source, my roots, my mother, always her, always us, never old, always new. To the pain and the thrills, to the laughs and the punches, always her. Always you, Mama. Thank you. Hi, my name is Caden Davila Sanabria, and this is a piece I wrote called Writer's Block. Her hair had never been so greasy. She'd never gone this long without a shower, without a full meal, without sleep. But the words, the words wouldn't stop and neither could she lest the words escape into the ether. Ether, that's a good word. Where can she put it? The digital clock is blinking at her, its synthetic green light casting a ghostly pallor over her room. The room smells a bit too, too many days of dirty clothes and closed windows. She could get up and open a window, but she can't stand up. She'll lose her words. And she can't lose her words. They are very, very pretty words. And they must be remembered because she hasn't found the words for a very long time. And what does it matter how long she stays here if she'd lost track of all the bones in her right arm and there was a burning sensation in her left leg that shot up and down painfully every half hour, reminding her that she was alive, that the words were safe, and that's what matters. Her own body is fossilizing, only to be found in a thousand years when alien archaeologists search for the remnants of humanity, which she supposes is a miserable fate, but the words, the words, they must be shared, all the words with their shape and color, more vibrant than you ever cared to notice she was Joan of Arc, rotting at her desk chair, possessed with a pen as her sword, and this room she feared was to be the stake, and she knew that if the word stopped, she would return to her body just in time to smell the burning flesh. Her burning flesh. She wonders if perhaps it would smell like chicken, but alas, no time for wondering such things. She has the words to tend to, stacking up around her like dirty dishes at her feet, towering above her and tipping over till they meet in the middle, caging her in between loneliness catharsis with disciple stabbing at her back and mourning hanging over her head. A thousand other words in between surrounding her like the wings of a seraphim. Be not afraid. But she didn't think that was right. Perhaps she should be afraid, as she frantically fills the page with her words, what has to be not what has to be won in the hundreds that cover her desk, piling up and spilling over half-empty coffee cups and English pens. She wonders where she found so many pens. No, no time to wonder, only time for words. Only time for words as her pen runs dry and she reaches into her torso. She can write just fine with a rib as a pen and her blood as the ink. For they always say that the words live inside you. The sacrifice is minor in testament to the words because the words become... Because the words come faster as the black ink turns to red, turns to sickly brown as her blood dries on the page. 
She is barely seeing as she writes her hands, leaving bloody smears on the paper. As she pushes it aside to begin a new page and she finds her rib is quickly shortening in her hand, ground down by her frantic scrawl. No matter, she has plenty more. As long as she has her words, the words must escape. It doesn't matter how. She's barely moved in days. She signed her life away the day the words came and now she is shackled to her desk. Devotion around her right wrist and panic on her left, chained to the floor and imprisoned in angel wings. Had she time to wonder, she would have wondered why this thing she loved, she craved so desperately, seemed to hurt her so bad. Why the words she worshipped so fervently came, had become her own confines and why she couldn't seem to care. But the words just keep on coming, an inferno of hellish flames, and flames are good because flames are alive, and she fears the day the flames become ice because what will she do when the words are gone? They are speeding towards her, spearing through her head like a knight's javelin, and she welcomes the words because the flames feel so nice where her body has gone cold, and she will stay there for weeks until her torso gapes wide and red and ribless, and her words become illegible as she bleeds, slumped over her desk, blood seeping into the pages, till the only thing legible was the synthetic green of the digital clock. Thank you. Hi, uh, hi, my name is G. Hayden, and my piece is called Power. Power. What does it mean to be in power? Power over people, power over yourself, power over life. How do you work your way to power? You become a sheep for the system, doing any random piece of paper they hand to you. You make sure to articulate yourself so, that, so they don't think you're dumb. You make sure to stay away from the wrong crowds of people. What do you feel in power? Nobody really cares about you. You find some friends, but are they really? Constantly belittling you, making you the butt of the joke all the time. They kick you when you're down. Do you feel empowered? You're still a sheep, sitting at a desk to live a suburban life, constantly typing at a, pe at a computer for the pieces of paper. The shepherd leading you with a vile scowl. Do you feel empowered? A night in the town, an alcoholic bio gently caresses your lips. The lie of alcohol makes you walk on the clouds, gives you an epiphany. You are not empowered. You run away from, from the herd out of a drunken rage. You leave your former life behind to leave an even worse one. Run down apartment, talking to slurs, and barely. Maybe it was better if you stayed a sheep. My name is Sincere Hayden, and I will be reading my piece, Nameless. Sincere, derived from the Latin word sincuris, I was given a name with such a strong meaning. To be honest, pure, and free from pretense or deceit. When I was growing up, I never understood the meaning of my name. I was always complimented on its uniqueness and my mom's creativity. I didn't understand the definition until middle school when my teacher used my name as an adjective to describe a storybook character. I was confused. How could someone be acting like me? Since then, I have been trying my hardest to act accordingly. I need to meet my expectations of my name, to be honest, pure, and free from pretense and deceit. Sincere needs to be the perfect daughter, perfect sister, and perfect person. I feel the need to be the person people look up to. When your expectations come from the Webster Dictionary, it's hard not to question if you're acting appropriately. I have never wished to change my name or be named something different, but I do desire to be nameless. If I was born with no name, there would be no premeditated assumptions or uses of my name at the end of your emails. If I was nameless, I could write my own Webster Dictionary definition that I can live up to. Many people wouldn't be fond of the idea of being a Jane Doe, but for one day, being nameless would grant me so much peace. Thank you.
Hi, my name is James Jackson, and I'm reading my piece, The End, inspired by spoken word poet Jamal May. These are the things that are demanded of me when the landscapes crumble and the beautiful thorn roses burst into flames. As the sky begins to crack and all the light in the universe is shining through the creases of the sky, focused on one place and one place only, this accursed earth. A time when going back to school, working hard and grinding eventually becomes a nuisance, something of no value. When love is the biggest priority for all, not just relationship love, but the uncontrollable, unconditional love embedded into the populace. A time where no item is important, not a smartphone, a video game, a car or a house, only those around you and the Lord whose decision determines everyone's fate. Pure light shining into the eyes of the masses, unable to see anything besides a dark figure with a fluorescent aura surrounding this entity. Only being able to sense the naturally sweet smell of untainted fruits. The words of all the wrongs committed in life spilling into the airs of the bears of sin. The numb feeling of when you've lost it all, possessing your body, impotent to the tactual sensation of the fervid energy emitting from the illuminating light from above. Being in a neutral state to all things reliant on the choice too powerless in the face of power to resolve on your own, feeling every bit of pain that you have caused others as you've lived unrighteously in wickedness, experiencing a laughing sensation as tears fall down your face, wanting to scream your heart out but calmly remaining mute as with the, in with the inability to speak, being filled with the same excitement you once had when you went to that Six Flags a few summers back, Wrathful, exhilarating, sorrowful, contempt, colorless emotions, all consuming the entirety of each individual, regardless of the thoughts running through the minds of those who showed potency and strength during the most overwhelming time of their lives. The final chapter of their series of life, the end. My name is Robert Jones, and I will be reading my poem, Time, in its cold hands. A cold chill crawling up my spine as if it were looming over my shoulder. I swear, I felt a hand, a cold, ghoulish hand, a hand I can't shake away. The hand of time, cold, unforgiving, unapologetic, ticking till you forget and then it slips away. It's amazing how we have so little of it, but we choose to waste it. Moving through the motions, slipping through our hands, both the fairest and the cruelest. Hands of time never stop to think what it will impact as it moves on and on. And to imagine it won't impact you, to imagine time won't catch you, is to be a fool. Hello, my name is Ollie, and I will be reading my piece entitled Prison. I don't want to be here. Why should I? This isn't a school, it's a prison. School is supposed to make you feel safe and comfortable. Me? I'm being blamed, chained, completely drained. Oh, you'll get over it. You're nearly done. I don't think I can handle five more months in this school. Every morning I wake up thinking, oh yay, the last place I want to go to. I wonder what people are going to say about me today. When I've done nothing wrong. Have I ever acted like that? No. I've done nothing wrong to any of these people who are just deciding to crush me down every day. I mean, if people are trying to push me away from the school, they are doing a very good job. I'll give them that. This nice outfit that I'm wearing? Had to fight my mind just to wear something nice that I wanted to wear for this event. Why? Oh, because every, almost everyone here sees me as a small spider that they are ready to smash against the wall. 
It's funny too, started taking baby steps toward one of my main goals, which is being a voice actor. I got multiple roles for an animation someone is currently doing online. I'm doing it for experience, not even for money. Big step, especially since it's currently my first one. But is that happiness still there when I get to the school? I'll answer for you, no. Brought down so much that now I want to quit and give up that dream, almost like I gave up everything else. I almost gave up my own art because of how much I've been put down. Something I've been passionate about ever since middle school. I have to fake being happy and okay just so people don't think I'm seeking attention. I'm so scared and careful with what I do or say because now I'm even scared that my best friend is mad at me. I even asked them so many times before, hey, are you mad at me? I'm worried you're mad at me. Please don't be mad at me. I'll change. I know, I'm not, I know I'm not the only one. I know I'm not. If everyone gave me a dollar for every time they have been bullied, I'd be a millionaire, maybe a billionaire. And even with my dead name, I tell people all the time, even a few teachers, hey, I would feel more comfortable if you called me by the name I would prefer to be called, Ollie. Not even five minutes later, hey, Alexis, over here. Hey, Alexis, sit down, please. Alexis, what's the answer to this problem? Parents, teachers, think about it. Think about walking in my shoes in your kids' shoes. And think again before you say, you kids have it easy these days. Because we don't, we never did, and we never will. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Trinity, and I'm going to be reading my poem, Fear is Not My Home. Fear is not my home, nor is this four wall setting. The thin wallpaper that stays in place never touched or picked off because I never reached boredom to do so. Antiques forbidden to be broken, box TVs and controllers playing like the 70s. Constant begging to come see you and the fam, constant love when we walk through the door, constant butterscotch is thrown in our faces. Your love was overwhelming, craving to be closer with you, watching us even when you couldn't move, your deathbed was where you found comfort, where the pain silently overwhelmed you, ready to leave your pain, not ready to leave our big, never mind. Water bags attached to your legs, we ask so many questions, a smile to every answer. Unexpected morning news, unbearable passing, unbelievable at first. Watching your casket being lowered down, now imagining your simple smile in your empty house. Thank you. Hi, my name is Annalise Perez, and I'm going to be reading my piece called Calm Silence. She thinks so many thoughts in a day and only releases 10% of them. She thinks about the day that someone will want to talk to her with pure intentions. She doesn't want to make anyone have to listen to her, but she hopes when they do listen, it's not because she has a pretty face or has a nice body. She lets herself observe from a distance and comments when the volume level in the room is as quiet as her voice. But she remembers the time she let herself believe that this generation could be interested in anything more than a new body. Trying to enjoy the compliments and attention that was stripped away from her, from one she loved. Learning that it was all a cover up to get to his final desire. She wonders if people look at her in a different way for not matching their energy. She ends up pulling the short end of the ribbon as soon as they see she won't give them all of her. They like her because she is quiet, but they don't know the girl trapped in her thoughts that wants to tell someone about her daydreams and have them actually listen. She hasn't let herself be completely fooled by all the lies people put up as a front to hide that all they want is some fun. She's not sorry to say she won't be part of your recess time. She has found that loving herself is all that she needed to fill the void in her heart. So she will stay in her calm silence. Thank you. My name is Amani Riggins, and I'll be reading, You're the Issue, Please Stop.
I have really had it with you. Your comments about not wanting a black woman when you go for the white woman who looks, who looks okay. When you go for the white woman who spray tan makes her look like a white, white pumpkin that is painted orange. My brother in Christ, that ain't no preference. You'll let your ignorant and friends stay ignorant. When we talk about uh, being screwed up by white people, it's not offensive because you weren't offended. It's all uh, good because you don't have an issue. To you, that means the problem isn't there. You'll call your own people sensitive, like you haven't typed a four-page essay about how gay and transgender people are indoctrinating the children, like you actually care about children, like you haven't shown your toddler a thirst trap and said, they need to be taught young. We need to care about the children, my ass. No, no, no. You care about the children you're able to control, manipulate, and deceive. You have an issue with the black AIDS women until they agree with your BS. Carl, I do not care if your cousin's daughter's mother is a lesbian. You still made fun of your classmate because he was a gay man. Please get BLM out of that bio because black lives don't truly matter to you. You ain't for black lives unless they're straight and cisgender. You are not about to fool me. You don't care about your own people. And man, that hurts. It hurts the people who you're supposed to be with, the people who still love you even when you screw up. But you hate them. You hate them a lot. Because they're not your perfect image of a black person to stand with. You are the issue. You're the problem. Please stop. Thank you. Hello, my name is Shell Swaby, and I will be reading my poem entitled The Ballad for Black Hair. I cry out, yet where are those to listen to my song? I reach out to the world for love, but with no spoken acceptance, my hands return to my side with coiled curls instead. Society's expectations have kept me bound for so long, paraded by the people who I gave access to my prized braids. I was considered lucky for having blow-dried hair past my shoulders. I was special for my natural hair. I wasn't like other black people, and for that alone, I was good. I wished that my waves would have stayed forever. I thought that's how it would always be. I believed my leap into rejecting braids would have been for the better. By casting aside the style that didn't fit my face, I would have been freed from the ugliness that chained me to its wretched side. So once product after po product became stockpiled in my closet, as my hair lost its shine the longer I left it alone, and when every brush and pick tore away at my strands, my one source of pride and joy was gone and I became the one thing I tried to run away from. Black, with short hair, just like everyone else. It only took a year for my length to go away, and I didn't realize it until I stared at my own reckoning. My sorrow is too deep for the person I once was, so determined to be beautiful and loved that she took away something we both cherished. I reminisced through old photos and tried to convince myself that it's all right. I've cried, but not enough tears for hair growth to occur, and I hope that my road to recovery will be fast, but alas, I am impatient. I can't wait. And each day, it kills me. The praise I once received has now been lost to memory. The once faithful melodies became those of pity and scorn. Your hair used to be so thick and long. You paid the price for not listening to me. Not one superior in my life had the kindness to voice the love that I had been yearning for and to tell me that it was okay that my hair was shorter. I wish that my waves could have stayed forever, for I have learned that as you recede into what others call the dark, you lose hope of entering the light. I cry out, Yet where are those to listen to my song? For as long as we base our worth on our length, the masses will continue to tune out the ballad for black hair. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kayla Tarazi and I'll be reading my piece called A Walk in the Park. I've always hated walking alone. 
Though I've gotten used to it because it's pretty unavoidable, I wouldn't do it unless needed. I tell people I'm too lazy. Sure, that's easier to swallow, but it's hardly the truth. You see, there's a reason why I change my behavior when a man is near me on the street, why I quicken my pace, why I look behind, why I tuck my keys between my fingers. The answer is painfully clear, laid out before me like a body outlined on the pavement. I didn't want to become another dead girl on the news, another tale of innocence being torn away like the clothes off the girls who were just trying to go home. I, don't, I didn't want to be a dog toy, ripped apart for enjoyment and then thrown away without a second thought. And then they have the nerve to tell you, not all men, right, okay. Let me think of the men I trust. I could count them on my fingertips. One, two, three, it gets a little fuzzy after six. As Tyler, the creator, once said, a boy is a gun, dangerous and unpredictable, yet capable of keeping you safe. So you kind of want one by your side, right? You know, to protect you from what you fear. Ironic, isn't it? So no, I can't just chill out. I can't stop my hands from shaking. I can't stop my heart from pounding out of my chest. Not until men learn what it means when we say no. Not until we are seen for more than our bodies. Not until we are more than dolls to play with and tear apart. Not until, we, not until sisters stop becoming statistics. Not until woman is synonymous with human. Thank you. Sorry, I'm a bit excited. Um, my name is DeAndre, and I'm going to read my somewhat scary story called Home. And I just want to say, like, there is a few choice of words that um, may not be safe for work, but, like, I want to be, you know, completely transparent. So, <laughs> all right, I'm going to start. It was a dark, foggy night that was so thick you couldn't see far past the streetlight. Near those streetlights, there was a gray house with a set of twins named Marina and Nessa waiting for their parents to come home. Nessa, Marina shouted, girl, shut up. I'm down the hall. No need for all that unnecessary yelling, Nessa replied. First of all, don't tell me to shut up. Second, where did you put my son hat? Marina asked a bit annoyed. <clears throat> Why do you even need a sun hat? It's nighttime anyways, Nessa said a bit confused. It doesn't matter. Tell me where it is. Marina snapped her fingers, signaling Nessa to go get the hat. Fine, I'll go. Nessa dragged her feet across the carpet all the way to her room to get the hat. The house phone started to ring. The ringtone sounded similar to a wind chime. Marina picked it up. Hello, she said into the phone with a softer tone. The person on the line started breathing heavily. Hello, Marina said louder, getting aggravated. Nessa came back. I found the hat, Nessa said with the hat in her hand. Marina just put her palm in Nessa's direction, essentially telling her to hold on. Ooh. Here it comes. Listen here, you fat, greasy, neck ass bitch. What you're not going to do is waste my time breathing all hard like that. Marina then hung up the phone. Bet you wouldn't say that in front of mommy, Nessa said with an eyebrow raised. And I bet you I wouldn't say it in front of mommy either, Marina said, and they both started laughing. Now give me my damn hat. Marina snatched her hat back from Nessa. See, now you're doing too much, cuz you didn't have to snatch it. Nessa scrunched her face up at Marina. Oh well, I'm gonna go take a shower now. Marina said and walked off. All right, Nessa replied. Marina went to the bathroom and hopped in the shower. While she was showering, the light started to flicker, you know, for a quick second. Nessa, is that you? Marina asked. The light started flickering again. Nessa, stop playing with me because I would hate to smack you with this shampoo bottle. <laughs>
Okay, I got it. I got it. <laughs> the lights went back to normal. Marina hopped out the shower and got dressed, then left the bathroom. Nessa! Marina yelled. Girl, what? Shut your damn mouth, Nessa said with an over tone in her voice. First of all, don't catch an attitude with me because I'm not the one. Second, why were you messing with the lights, Marina said. Well, no one told you to yell, and no, I wasn't messing with the lights, Nessa explained. Then who did? Marina said it with a very confused look on her face. Maybe a ghost? Nessa said as she shrugged. Don't do that, because you know I don't like stuff like that, Marina said a bit scaredly. The lights suddenly went out. Nessa, now I'm about to fuck you up, because why you play too much? Marina said. <laughs> That wasn't even me, I swear, Nessa said, defending herself. Um, okay, you know, since the lights are out, let's just go find the generator in the basement, Nessa suggested. Uh, the basement so we could get killed? No, you're sick. <laughs> well, I'll just go by myself then. Nessa turned the flashlight on her phone and started to walk. Uh, wait for me, Marina ran and caught up to Nessa. They opened the basement door and shined the flashlight to see the creepy, dark, and cobweb-filled stairs. We, we really gonna go down there? Marina said with her voice all quiet. Yes, now stop being scary, Nessa said. Uh, don't do me, cause you know it's scary down there. Marina scoffed. All right, let's go. Nessa walked down the stairs and Marina followed. They walked through the dusty basement to find the generator. Once they found it, they turned it back on and went back up the stairs. See, that wasn't so bad. Oh, what was that? And then, and then yeah. <laughs> oh. Hey, everyone. My name is Danae, and the poem that I'll be presenting is called, Who Am I? When you've been playing a role for most of your life, this question is exhausting to look at. I don't know, I'm only 16 is what I usually say. I want to tell people that I've gotten so good at acting, I can't remember if my favorite color is my own. That in the morning, I dress in whatever facade I need to get through the day, and at night, I hang it back in my closet. My life is an Oscar-worthy performance. When my therapist asked, who are you? I got offended. I wanted to tell her to just sit back and enjoy the show. That in only a few sessions, I'd have built a new mask that was perfect enough to fool her too. For once in my life, my silence was loud enough to be an answer. And she asked, are you tired? And for only a second, I allowed someone to see me. Yes, thank you. Thank you all so much for listening to all of our wonderful creative, creative writing pieces. As a reminder, CAS and NHS are hosting their annual Thanksgiving event with food and activities for you to all enjoy in the cafeteria right now. The art gallery is also now open for public viewing. Feel free to head down to either event and enjoy the rest of your day. We'll see you back in the spring for more writing pieces. Thank you. My song, I reach out to the world for love, but with no spoken acceptance, my hands return to my side with coiled curls instead. Society's expectations have kept me bound for so long, paraded by the people who I gave access to my prized braids. I was considered lucky for having blow-dried hair past my shoulders. I was special for my natural hair. I wasn't like other black people, and for that alone, I was good. I wish that my waves would have stayed forever. I thought that's how it would always be. I believed my leap into rejecting braids would have been for the better. By casting aside the style that didn't fit my face, I would have been freed from the ugliness that chained me to its wretched side. So once product after po product became stockpiled in my closet, 
as my hair lost its shine, the longer I left it alone. And when every brush and pick tore away at my strands, my one source of pride and joy was gone, and I became the one thing I tried to run away from. Black, with short hair, just like everyone else. It only took a year for my length to go away, and I didn't realize it until I stared at my own reckoning. My sorrow is too deep for the person I once was, so determined to be beautiful and loved that she took away something we both cherished. I reminisced through old photos and tried to convince myself that it's all right. I've cried, but not enough tears for hair growth to occur, and I hope that my road to recovery will be fast, but alas, I am impatient. I can't wait. And each day, it kills me. The praise I once received has now been lost to memory. The once faithful melodies became those of pity and scorn. Your hair used to be so thick and long. You paid the price for not listening to me. Not one superior in my life had the kindness to voice the love that I had been yearning for and to tell me that it was okay that my hair was shorter. I wish that my waves could have stayed forever, for I have learned that as you recede into what others call the dark, you lose hope of entering the light. I cry out, Yet where are those to listen to my song? For as long as we base our worth on our length, the masses will continue to tune out the ballad for black hair. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kayla Tarazi and I'll be reading my piece called A Walk in the Park. <laughs> I've always hated walking alone. Though I've gotten used to it because it's pretty unavoidable, I wouldn't do it unless needed. I tell people I'm too lazy. Sure, that's easier to swallow, but it's hardly the truth. You see, there's a reason why I change my behavior when a man is near me on the street, why I quicken my pace, why I look behind, why I tuck my keys between my fingers. The answer is painfully clear, laid out before me like a body outlined on the pavement. I didn't want to become another dead girl on the news, another tale of innocence being torn away like the clothes off the girls who were just trying to go home. I, don't, I didn't want to be a dog toy, ripped apart for enjoyment and then thrown away without a second thought. And then they have the nerve to tell you, not all men, right, okay. Let me think of the men I trust. I could count them on my fingertips. One, two, three, it gets a little fuzzy after six. As Tyler, the creator, once said, a boy is a gun, dangerous and unpredictable, yet capable of keeping you safe. So you kind of want one by your side, right? You know, to protect you from what you fear. Ironic, isn't it? So no, I can't just chill out. I can't stop my hands from shaking. I can't stop my heart from pounding out of my chest. Not until men learn what it means when we say no not until we are seen for more than our bodies, not until we are more than dolls to play with and tear apart, not until, we, not until sisters stop becoming statistics, not until woman is synonymous with human. Thank you. Sorry, I'm a bit excited. Um, my name is DeAndre, and I'm going to read my somewhat scary story called Home. And I just want to say, like, there is a few choice of words that um, may not be safe for work, but, like, I want to be, you know, completely transparent. So, <laughs> all right, I'm going to start. It was a dark, foggy night that was so thick you couldn't see far past the streetlight. Near those streetlights, there was a gray house with a set of twins named Marina and Nessa waiting for their parents to come home. Nessa, Marina shouted, girl, shut up. I'm down the hall. No need for all that unnecessary yelling, Nessa replied. First of all, don't tell me to shut up. Second, where did you put my son hat? Marina asked a bit annoyed. <clears throat> 
why do you even need a sun hat? It's nighttime anyways. Nessa said a bit confused. It doesn't matter. Tell me where it is. Marina snapped her fingers, signaling Nessa to go get the hat. Fine, I'll go. Nessa dragged her feet across the carpet all the way to her room to get the hat. The house phone started to ring. The ringtone sounded similar to a wind chime. Marina picked it up. Hello, she said into the phone with a softer tone. The person on the line started breathing heavily. Hello, Marina said louder, getting aggravated. Nessa came back. I found the hat, Nessa said with the hat in her hand. Marina just put her palm in Nessa's direction, essentially telling her to hold on. Here it comes. Listen here, you fat, greasy, neck-ass bitch. What you're not going to do is waste my time breathing all hard like that. <laughs> Marina then hung up the phone. Bet you wouldn't say that in front of mommy, Nessa said with an eyebrow raised. And I bet you I wouldn't say it in front of mommy either, Marina said, and they both started laughing. Now give me my damn hat. Marina snatched her hat back from Nessa. See, now you're doing too much, cuz you didn't have to snatch it. Nessa scrunched her face up at Marina. Oh, well, I'm going to go take a shower now, Marina said and walked off. All right, Nessa replied. Marina went to the bathroom and hopped in the shower. While she was showering, the lights started to flicker, you know, for a quick second. Nessa, is that you? Marina asked. The lights started flickering again. Nessa, stop playing with me because I would hate to smack you with this shampoo bottle. (laughs) I got it, I got it. (laughs) The lights went back to normal. Marina hopped out the shower and got dressed, then left the bathroom. Nessa, Marina yelled. Girl, what? Shut your damn mouth, Nessa said with an over tone in her voice. First of all, don't catch an attitude with me because I'm not the one. Second, why were you messing with the lights, Marina said. Well, no one told you to yell, and no, I wasn't messing with the lights, Nessa explained. Then who did? Marina said it with a very confused look on her face. Maybe a ghost, Nessa said as she shrugged. Don't do that because you know I don't like stuff like that, Marina said a bit scaredly. The light suddenly went out. Nessa, now I'm about to fuck you up, because why? You play too much, Marina said. (laughs) That wasn't even me, I swear, Nessa said, defending herself. Um, Okay, you know, since the lights are out, let's just go find the generator in the basement, Nessa suggested. Uh, The basement so we could get killed? No, you're sick. Well, I'll just go by myself then. Nessa turned the flashlight on her phone and started to walk. Uh, wait for me. Marina ran and caught up to Nessa. They opened the basement door and shined the flashlight to see the creepy, dark, and cobweb-filled stairs. We, we really gonna go down there? Marina said with her voice all quiet. Yes, now stop being scary, Nessa said. Uh, don't do me, cause you know it's scary down there. Marina scoffed. All right, let's go. Nessa walked down the stairs, and Marina followed. They walked through the dusty basement to find the generator. Once they found it, they turned it back on and went back up the stairs. See, that wasn't so bad. Oh, what was that? And then, and then yeah. <laughs> oh. Hey everyone, my name is Danae, and the poem that I'll be presenting is called Who Am I? When you've been playing a role for most of your life, this question is exhausting to look at. I don't know, I'm only 16 is what I usually say. I wanna tell people that I've gotten so good at acting, I can't remember if my favorite color is my own. That in the morning, I dress in whatever facade I need to get through the day, and at night, I hang it back in my closet. My life is an Oscar-worthy performance. When my therapist asked, who are you? I got offended. 
I wanted to tell her to just sit back and enjoy the show, that in only a few sessions, I'd have built a new mask that was perfect enough to fool her too. For once in my life, my silence was loud enough to be an answer. And she asked, are you tired? And for only a second, I allowed someone to see me. Yes, thank you. Thank you all so much for listening to all of our wonderful creative, creative writing pieces. As a reminder, CAS and NHS are hosting their annual Thanksgiving event with food and activities for you to all enjoy in the cafeteria right now. The art gallery is also now open for public viewing. Feel free to head down to either event and enjoy the rest of your day. We'll see you back in the spring for more writing pieces. Thank you. Thank you.